On the morning of September 18, 1970, paramedics arrived at the Samarkand Hotel in London's Notting Hill neighborhood to find Jimi Hendrix covered in vomit and unresponsive. The apartment door was wide open and nobody else was there. They rushed Hendrix to St. Mary Abbott's Hospital where Dr. Martin Seifert tried and failed to revive him. According to Seifert, the guitarist's body was already cold and blue when he got to the hospital, and he called the attempt to resuscitate him merely a formality. Jimi Hendrix was pronounced dead at 12.45 p.m. He was just 27 years old. The autopsy listed his cause of death as asphyxiation, and his death was presumed to be accidental. But other theories have emerged in the 50 years since that fateful day, including suicide, and even murder. You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting's assistant editor, Megan Liscombe, and today I'll be talking about the last days of Jimi Hendrix and the mystery that surrounds his death to this day. In 1970, Jimi Hendrix's musical career was riding high. In that year, he followed on the success of his three recent studio albums with a live release called Band of Gypsies, and his iconic Woodstock and Monterey Pop Festival performances were both released on vinyl that year as well. His Cry of Love tour ran from April to September and took him all over the United States and Europe, with 37 stops, including England's Isle of Wight Festival. The last stop was on September 6th in Germany at an event called the Love and Peace Festival. And when the tour finally ended, Hendrix was exhausted. Friends say he felt overworked and suffered from insomnia while also enduring a lingering flu-like infection. Plus, he was facing two pending lawsuits a paternity suit, and a recording contract dispute. And to top it all off, he was feeling deeply disillusioned with the music industry and often felt isolated and alone. Hendrix spent the last weeks of his life in London, resting up after his long months on the road. He gave his final interview on September 11th, speaking with a reporter from Record Mirror. He canceled a performance that was scheduled for September 13th in Rotterdam because his bass player was suffering from severe exhaustion and paranoia. He played guitar in public for the last time on September 16th. His friend Eric Burden of The Animals invited him to sit in on a jam with his new band War at Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club. The people who saw it said that Hendrix played in an unusually laid-back style that night, far from the guitar-smashing force of nature audiences had come to expect. And the next day, September 17th, would be Jimi Hendrix's last full day on Earth. Jimi Hendrix spent most of his last day with his girlfriend, a German figure skater with long blonde hair named Monica Dannemann. He woke up at her place at the Samarkand Hotel, and she took the last known photos of him in her garden that afternoon. In some of the pictures, he poses with his favorite Fender guitar that he called Black Beauty, even playfully pretending to pour a cup of tea for the instrument. But despite the whimsy of some of these photos, he still looks tired, a little puffy, and not quite well. Later, they went shopping at a Chelsea antique market, and Hendrix bought some clothes. They stopped by Hendrix's room at the Cumberland Hotel, 
where Hendrix called his lawyer to talk about getting out of his relationship with his UK manager, Mike Jeffrey, who you'll be hearing more about in a little bit. Next, they went to their friend Philip Harvey's place where they smoked hash and drank wine. Harvey had some other women over and Danneman got upset because she thought Hendrix was flirting with them. After an argument, Hendrix and Danneman went back to the Samarkand at about 11. There, he took a bath and wrote a poem that he gave to Danneman, reportedly saying to her, I want you to keep this. I don't want you to forget anything that is written. It's a story about you and me. Some people look at this poem as a kind of suicide note, while others close to him said it's not much different than many of his other writings. The poem ends, the story of life is quicker than the wink of an eye. The story of love is hello and goodbye until we meet again. After his bath, Hendrix took an amphetamine known as a black bomber and Danneman drove him to a party that one of his business associates was having. By then, it was about 1.45 a.m. Hendrix went to the party without her, and other guests recalled Danneman ringing the flat's intercom repeatedly, demanding to speak with Hendrix. At around 3 a.m., he relented and left the party to go home with her. According to Danneman's account, Hendrix begged her for a sleeping pill, as the amphetamine he'd taken was keeping him awake. She refused, but unable to sleep herself, she snuck a pill at about 6 a.m. with Hendrix still up, laying next to her. And at this point, her story gets a little murky. On the day he died, she told police that she woke up at 11 to see him choking on vomit and called an ambulance. In later tellings, she said that she woke up at 10 or 10.20 a.m. and Hendrix was sleeping normally. She then left the apartment to buy cigarettes, returning just after 11. By that point, she says Hendrix was still breathing, but something was wrong. She couldn't wake him, so she called an ambulance. She later revealed that she had counted her Vesperex sleeping tablets to discover that she was missing nine of them, 18 times the recommended dose. She thought Hendrix must have taken these barbiturates while she slept beside him. At times, Danneman claimed to have ridden in the ambulance with Hendrix, though the EMTs and doctors who were there deny this, maintaining that he was found alone. She also told the press just after his death that they had been secretly engaged, but that story has been disputed as well. Danneman's ever-changing story led many to think that perhaps foul play was involved. And these suspicions only grew as more details about Hendrix's death emerged. On September 21st, 1970, forensic pathologist Professor Robert Donald Tier did a post-mortem examination of Hendrix's body. His blood alcohol level wasn't terribly high. At 100 milligrams per 100 milliliters, Tier said it was the equivalent of about four pints of beer. Hendrix had no marks on his skin that would suggest intravenous drug use, and his blood work revealed 1.8 grams of barbiturate 20 milligrams of amphetamine, and another 20 milligrams of cannabis. Hendrix's left lung was partially collapsed, with vomit in both lungs and 400 milliliters of fluid in his chest. A half-digested meal still sat in his stomach. Tier determined that the cause of death was inhalation of vomit due to barbiturate intoxication. He ruled that there was no evidence of suicide. And though there were some wild rumors at the time, including tales of a supposed Black Panther plot to kill Hendrix for not being political enough, his death was generally accepted as an accident for decades. Then, in 2009, former Hendrix roadie James Tappy Wright published a memoir that changed everything. 
In his book, Wright claimed that Hendrix's manager, Mike Jeffrey, had murdered his client for trying to leave him. According to Wright, Jeffrey confessed in 1971, saying, quote, I had to do it, Tappy. You understand, don't you? I had to do it. You know damn well what I'm talking about. I was in London the night of Jimmy's death, and together with some old friends, we went round to Monica's hotel room, got a handful of pills, and stuffed them into his mouth, then poured a few bottles of red wine deep into his windpipe. I had to do it. Jimmy was worth much more to me dead than alive. That son of a bitch was going to leave me. If I lost him, I'd lose everything. Wright claimed that Mike Jeffrey had taken out a $2 million insurance policy on Hendrix shortly before he died. He believed that Jeffrey killed Hendrix in order to collect on this policy. However, whether this policy actually existed remains unclear. Still, Hendrix biographers have often noted Jeffrey's aggressive and underhanded management style. He reportedly had a penchant for siphoning funds away from his client and stashing them in his own offshore accounts. There's even a tale that Hendrix bass player Noel Redding once asked Jeffrey where he was going with briefcases full of the band's money. And in response, Jeffrey asked him to leave the band. If true, Tappy's story raises a couple of big questions. Was Monica Danneman complicit in the plot to kill Jimi Hendrix? And why did Tappy wait nearly 40 years to come forward with Jeffrey's confession? Conveniently, by the time Tappy's book hit the shelves, Jeffrey was long dead, having been killed in an airplane accident in 1973. If Tappy's shocking claims were true, there was no way to exact justice. But there was also no way to completely disprove the story either. However, other business associates of Hendrix have since come forward to deny his allegations. Bob Levine, Hendrix's US manager, gave an interview in Music Radar in 2011, where he said that Tappy fabricated the story to sell more books. According to Levine, it was common practice to have multi-million dollar insurance policies on performers in those days. So even if Jeffrey had taken out such a policy on Hendrix, it wouldn't have been cause for alarm. Levine went on to say he'd had conversations about the book with Tappy, saying, quote, he told me, Bob, I need a hook for the book. I need a handle. He needed something that would be a grabber. Well, saying that Jimmy was murdered as a grabber. Saying that Jimmy was murdered by his manager is an even bigger grabber. But it's certainly not the truth. So, what is the truth? All I'm gonna do is go on and do what I feel, but like right now, I don't, I can't feel anything right now because like, there's a few things that just happened, you know. And so like, I just have to like lay back and think about it all. Unfortunately, the only other person who likely knew what really happened in Jimi Hendrix's final moments has also been dead for decades. Monica Danneman committed suicide in 1996. She was found in a fume-filled car near her home in Sussex, just a couple of days after being found guilty of contempt in a UK high court. Oddly enough, she was being sued by another one of Hendrix's former girlfriends, Kathy Etchingham. Etchingham was Hendrix's longest-term girlfriend, as the pair had dated for about two and a half years in the 60s. After Hendrix died, Danneman and Etchingham feuded, with Etchingham saying that Hendrix barely knew Danneman and the two certainly weren't engaged. For her part, Danneman repeatedly characterized Etchingham as an inveterate liar. Prior to the 1996 case, Etchingham sued Danneman for libel and won. After Danneman faced humiliation again in court with Etchingham, she chose to end her life. So today, 50 years after Hendrix died, his allegedly murderous manager and his maybe fiance have both been dead for decades. So to find the truth about Hendrix's death, all we have to go on are old stories like Monica Danneman's several shifting versions of the morning when her boyfriend died in her bed, and James Tappy Wright's long belated revelation that Hendrix had been murdered. 
But maybe the real explanation is the simplest one. That Hendrix was just trying to get some sleep, took too many pills, and slipped out of this world and into the next. Or as he put it, the story of life is quicker than the wink of an eye. The story of love is hello and goodbye until we meet again. Thanks for listening to History Uncovered. I'm History Uncovered's producer, Kit Westneat. If you like the show, help others find us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to follow the All That's Interesting and History Revealed pages on Facebook and Real History Uncovered on Instagram. Make sure you don't miss out on the new episodes and subscribe to the History Uncovered podcast. And keep up with our latest stories at allthatsinteresting.com. If you have a question about the show or just want to say hi, feel free to call us at 929-526-3029 or email us at podcast at allthatsinteresting.com. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like Legends of the Old West and Redacted History. Until next time, keep exploring.